This is Maker Galaxy. We're always talking about the future of design, the future of technology, the future of making. In a world where umbrellas can act as personal mobile weather stations, a world where virtual window screens can easily add augmented reality to automobiles, how do we find the next big thing? Maker Galaxy is a show that explores the crossroads of design, technology, and the future of making. Welcome to the show, everybody. I'm your host, Simon Martin, and this week we talked to Israeli industrial designer and sustainable furniture craftsman Eli Chizik. Eli's background in both carpentry and product design led him to focus on designing furniture made from reclaimed scraps that he converts into new sheets of material to work from. We'll talk with Eli about everything from how he got his start in product design how he creates his own material to work with made from scraps, what he thinks of the digital fabrication movement, and more. Today's episode is brought to you by the Object 500 Connects 3 from Stratasys, the world's only color and multi-material 3D printer. Offering incomparably brilliant and consistent colors, plus transparent colors, The Objet 500 Connects 3 lets you create the most true-to-life modeling possible. Find out more at Stratasys.com. Welcome, Eli. We'll get into your sustainable furniture in a little bit, but before we do, we want to know, where can we find the best breakfast pastry on Earth, and what should we get there? (laughs) The best breakfast pastry on earth, where can we find it? Um, I would have to say here in, well, here in Tel Aviv, I would have to say that would be the Baker's Cafe. You'd have to go to the Baker's Cafe and it would be, um, here we call it Blekas uh, in Hebrew. That's like a dough pastry with some... Uh, cheese on the inside and stuff like that so that's an excellent place to go sounds sounds delicious sounds delicious so eli before we go any further can you tell us a little bit more about who you are and what your design background is um okay i'm 40 years old i uh, graduated from the hit which is uh, the cholon institute of technology in israel Uh, i graduated about 11 years ago, um, studying product design, and a few years before that I studied carpentry, so I was a carpenter before I was a designer, um, and uh, since, uh, since graduating I've been um, an independent designer, I did uh, for a few years, I've been doing some work for, as a, for development, uh, develop, uh, concept development for Tupperware. Okay. Um, and in the past two or three years, I shifted into uh, kind of combined my expertise of carpentry and design and uh, shifted to furniture design. Excellent. And so as a product designer, when did you first realize that making awesome stuff was probably going to be your path in life? <laughs> uh, you know, it was a hope. It was always a hope to make awesome stuff. Right. Um, uh, that's kind of the goal and uh, you know as a designer you know if you're really into it it's it's all around you it's all you do it's what you do before you go to sleep it's what you do when you drive the car you're always thinking about it you always want to do the next you know big thing or try and invent something or try and invent the wheel in a way so passion wise it was always there Um, but it took me a while to figure out the path that led me to, to furniture design, specifically, and sustainable design. Um, I always wanted to define myself as a sustainable designer, because that's also kind of, of, of how I try to live my life, you know, uh, environment friendly and uh, whatever comes with it, you know, to consume less and stuff like that. Um, but I 
I, w- I was always doing products. There's a big conflict, you know, as a designer, because we design, we always make more stuff, and that's kind of a big problem we have at the moment with the world. We are, we consume too much, and we keep making more and more stuff. Right. So the the I was very frustrated because I was you know I was designing stuff and I was enjoying it and making things and I always wanted to figure out a way to define myself as an environmental designer and do things that their impact on the environment would not be as harsh as you know as general products. Where do you remember that time when uh, your your interest shifted from just designing products to designing sustainable products? Um, well, as I said, the interest was always there. I just I, I couldn't I couldn't really find the path because um, I tried for a while to stay away from carpentry because in a way uh, my path was that I started with carpentry and then moved to product design and I thought you know going back to carpentry would take me a step back and it took me a while to realize that I have an advantage here because I have a certain expertise with one you know, as a carpenter and a craftsman, and I can combine that with my skills as a product designer. And uh, that's kind of, that was kind of, uh, it hit me about, you know, three years ago, that that would be a, a step that for me, you know, also making the designs, things that I actually make myself, you know, craftsmanship and, you know, uh, really limited editions and special things and you don't make that much, but what you make, you know, you're responsible for it and, you know, you, you know you, you're know, you going to make a very good product that's going to last for years. So, so that kind of led me to that. Okay, so now you've won numerous awards for your sustainable furniture designs, which are not only impressive from a build and quality standpoint, but also how you approach mixing different materials into a cohesive design. So how did you go about uh, developing this aesthetic and finding scrap material? Uh, I mean, did you just find some scrap material one day and decide you wanted to see what you could do with it? I mean, how did all the all of this start with the way you develop sustainable furniture? Um, I would first like to correct one thing. I, the, I've won numerous awards, but they were actually for products I did before I started the sustainable design. And the sustainable okay. furniture is still, you know, fairly new. So I hope to win awards in the future, but uh, <laughs> only time will tell. Okay. Um, <laughs> What happened was um, I kind of got a bit into the carpentry business again, and I have many friends that you know own carpentry and say all about the city. And I started realizing the amounts of waste that they throw away. You know, pieces that for a regular carpentry would seem like waste because they're too small, and you know they, they do things that are rather standard, and you know whatever. Whatever you know, it's an offcut. It's an offcut, and they just don't know what to do with it. So eventually, you know, they put it in a pile, and after a while, it goes to the garbage because they just run out of space. Right. And, and I was, you know, that was my first attraction. So I thought, okay, how do I take that, which is, you know, I just can collect it from them and they keep it for me, and make furniture out of that. Now, one of my, you know, one of my main goals was. I want to make furniture that is really, it's really important to me that it's non-compromised. I don't want people to come in and say, ah, okay, okay, I see that, that's recycled, you know, it's a waste, and it's like this, and you see a nail over there, and it's, you know, kind of a rough design. My goal was to make a piece of furniture that, you know, someone would walk in, he would see it, he has no, you know, no care for sustainability or, you know, he's not aware of it or something like that. His first reaction should be, okay, this is this furniture I like, I want it. The next thing would be the story that comes with a piece of furniture. Because, um, you know, eventually, you know, the goal is to, you know, for people to buy it and use it. and. If it's not aesthetic and it's not a special design, as it is, you know, without telling the whole story behind it, which is interesting and it has a value. Um, if people don't come in and say, "Okay, wow," then then you know you're missing something, as far as I'm concerned. Okay, so you source a variety of usable scrap material. 
but you also create new material to work with from that scrap. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you create this new and usable material to work with? Yeah, um, well, what I do, I take uh, planks of uh, wood or MDF covered with veneer. They're all, uh, I try to take the same thickness, you know, 17 to 19 millimeters. And I take that material and I start, you know, sorting it and I start cutting it. Most of the times, you know, really I, I, I did freestyle. You know, I go and I cut, cut diagonals and see whatever comes out. And I start sorting and mixing those materials basically to create a new sheet. Now, the sheet is like, uh, when I'm done with it, it's like any laminated sheet, you know, where you buy a sheet of uh, birch plywood, it would be at a certain size, and you use it as raw material to build furniture. So what I do is I create that sheet. I would take many, many different materials, I mix them, I sort them in a way, of course, that is, as far as I think, is aesthetic, and then I clamp them together to one sheet. Now, that sheet, once I have a sheet, that's the raw material I can design with. Um, it was very important to me to do it that way also, because I don't want to, you know, I don't want to take a piece of furniture from the street and start doing a variation on it and fixing it and stuff like that. I want to design. That's my passion, and I wanted, I wanted raw material. You know, something that wouldn't limit me with what I do. That I could design anything with it. That was. That was really one of the goals, because, uh, you know, I don't want to design the same thing, and I don't want to do only graphic things. I want, you know, I don't want to get bored. I want to do new stuff. Every right. Time. I want to, you know, I want to create. That's the drive. And with that, you have plenty of examples of what you've done on your website, uh, stuff that you've been able to do with meshing these different materials together. So to date, what has been your favorite build and why? Uh, <laughs> I have my favorite builds. Um, well, uh, one of my last builds, which I'm actually going to present in uh, Paris this September, is uh, the gradient table. Now, the gradient table, uh, its version now is actually industrial. It's not really made out of leftovers, but the prototype was made out of leftovers, and it's a uh, gradient scale of 10 different kinds of uh, veneers, uh, or, you know, in order from uh, dark to uh, bright. So they, they create kind of a gradient pattern. Okay. And uh, I took, you know, I took, uh, the, I took that prototype and one of the things I do, you know, I do, pro I keep, I do a lot of prototypes and the prototypes are the more artistic one-off uh, you know, special, special, unique pieces. And then as a second step, I take these prototypes and I try to make an industrious uh, variation to make something, you know, to take what was good in that and try to think, okay, how can I do this industrially to move it another step forward? So, uh, so the gradient now is actually uh, one of the prototypes I really like. Right. And another one is called uh, Dada, and that I did about a year ago for an exhibition I did here in uh, Tel Aviv. Uh, I was asked to, um, to choose uh, 10, uh, 10 uh, design uh, periods in the past 200 years, you know, from Al Novo to Al Deco, Dada, Memphis, or whatever I liked, and to do uh, interpretations in my language with what I do of each uh, period. Um, so the data table, um, kind of like the period, is a very confused and mixed table and uh, I, I like the result and I like the, the process and the craftsmanship behind it. So that's, uh, that's, I would say that's the second one. Awesome. On Solid Smack, uh, recently we featured some behind-the-scenes images of your shop, which is certainly well-stocked with various tools and plenty of material. So what about your favorite tool in your shop? If you could only take one tool or machine with you to a 
deserted island which which tool might that be um <laughs> that's <laughs> that's tough there's not one there's not much you can do with only one tool i'd say but uh, that's a good point well what about what about yeah. if you could stay in your shop and not go to a deserted island what 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 would be your your favorite tool to use i'd say my favorite tool is actually um it's a Swiss machine. It's called the Lamello. It's, uh, it's, not, it's not that big. And it's for... Uh, I, I just use it a lot. So it's kind of like... I feel like it's uh, you know an extension of my hand already. And it's, uh, it's a machine I use to, uh, for the clamping. Before the clamping, you have to make like uh, slots on the side of the plank. And then you put like a biscuit inside. Okay. So because I make the sheets, you know, for each sheet I would have to use the machine you know I use it for two seconds but you have to do it like 140 times okay so <laughs> you fin- you finish that and you know you're not you're not sure anymore you know where the machine ends and you begin <laughs> with that uh, would you happen to have any advice for somebody who is setting up their own shop I would say yeah it's, it's not in the workshop and it's not in the I, I would just say it's you know it's all in your head you know, it's, you just need a lot of imagination and, you know, and, you know, good hands and, and you know, just, you know, think, 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 and then do it and do prototypes and do prototypes again. You know, I, my process was uh, long and tiring until I got to, you know, a certain, you know, stage when I started showing the stuff. And, you know, even now, the new stuff now that I do the new stuff the older stuff doesn't seem as good you know it's, it's, it's like it's, it's a process it's a process you have to get through the process you have to advance and do more and more and more and you know and you have to love it definitely and I'm gonna I'm gonna switch the direction here just a little bit uh, we've also been seeing an increase of interest from kids who are enjoying the process of making things with their hands such as the recent spike of attendance at international maker fairs as an example. Uh, how important do you think it is that we teach tomorrow's generation the importance of working with your hands in a shop environment? I think it's extremely important. I think we have a, we, we, we are, you know, we're looking at the real problem with a new generation, you know, that's, you know, now at their 20s or even, you know, younger, and because they grew up straight into the computer world and the iPhones and everything, you know, they, they, don't, they don't know the process, they don't know where things come from and how they're made. And, and, you know, it's harsh to say, but there's like a bit of a, I'm sure, you know, every generation says it about, you know, the younger generation, but there's a certain, uh, there's a dumbing down, you know, we're getting, we're getting too far away from how things are made. We have to stay close. And I think, you know, we're, we're heading there now, in a way, because, you know, people are aware and craftsmanship is coming back. But it's really important, you know, to show them, you know, not only in terms of uh, design, also in terms of food, you know. You get everything packaged and you don't know where it's coming from. And, you know, yeah, you don't, don't go and see how they milk the cow or how they do this and where the rice comes from. I think that's very important to stay in touch with, you know, with life. Definitely. And and you touched base on this briefly, but alternately, what are your thoughts on the recent surge of consumer level digital fabrication techniques such as laser cutting and 3D printing? Would you say that we are gaining something or losing something or both? Um, I think it's... I think I think I think we're gaining. Eventually, we're gaining. First of all, you you know you can't stop it. It's a technology advancement, and it's happening. And it's you know part of our evolution, and we're gaining in terms of you know the imagination and the things we can do with it. We're losing in the terms of you know you see you start seeing articles about people making guns, printing guns at their own homes, and stuff like that, which you know that's creepy. Um, so, like, I think like every technology, you know, every new technology, you know, that people say it's bad, people say it's good. Eventually, it's about what we do. We're the responsible people. You know, the more people do try to do good with it and help each other, it's, it's about the people. 
Great answer. Great answer. Okay, one last question for you, Eli. What is one piece of advice you can give our listeners who might want to go out and find their own scrap material to build sustainable furniture with? Um, make friends. <laughs> <laughs> make a lot of friends. You know, go to people, be nice to them. You have, you know, there's many, many ways to do it. You can go to the, you can go to the industry, you can go to factories, you can go to carpentries, and you can go to building sites. Wherever you go, there's. You can go through the dumpsters, you know, a lot of people won't be nice about it, but, you know, go be nice about it, try to make friends, and, you know, if you're lucky, you find the right, you know, industry, in the right factory, you know, that has this amazing waste that they're not even realizing, and you'll be able to make something great with it. Excellent, excellent. Well, Eli, great advice, and thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Thank you, thank you. Today's episode was brought to you by the Omjet 500 Connex 3 from Stratasys, the world's only color and multi-material 3D printer. Offering incomparably brilliant and consistent colors, plus transparent colors, the Omjet 500 Connex 3 lets you create the most true-to-life modeling possible. Find out more at stratasys.com. Thanks for checking us out today and be sure to check out all of Eli's sustainable furniture creations over at elichisick.com. On our next episode, we'll be talking with Thiago da Costa, founder of the cloud-based 3D design and publishing tool, Lagoa. I'm your host, Simon Martin. Stay tuned and check in with us next week on Maker Galaxy. A production of EBD Media.